Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching from Israel by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. This week we look at Jesus' teachings on fulfilling the law as we continue our series, Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. And I am Jeffrey Seif. And I'm begging you not to throw out the Hebrew Bible, the Older Testament so-called. There's stuff in there for us. Jesus didn't come to dump it, did he? No, he came to fulfill it. And I believe in today's program, you're going to be teaching that he wants us to live it out, but it's not as hard as some made it out to be. I mean, the principles are timeless. You know, people dump on the literature, but as I like to say, there's 10 commandments. Which of those do you want to say is not applicable? Murder? No, we can do some murder. If you got to steal, <laughs> you, it's all good. No, I mean, the important thing is to see how this stuff applies mm -hmm. to life today, not how to throw it all under the bus. I, I love what the title is of this series, Sar Shalom, which we just learned is the prince yes. of peace. Right. That's what it's all about. Yes, peace. and if we live a just and equitable life, we have peace. Without that, we experience disequilibrium. And uh, people can uh, live with this internal dialogue that's discombobulated, and we need to learn to follow God's will and ways, and when we don't, to experience the peace that's available through forgiveness. I haven't always lived that way, have you? No. This is a great teaching today on how we should live. I believe it surely is, and right from the Lord's peace. mouth. Right. Right now, let's go up to the Galilee as we continue Sar Shalom. כי אמן אומר אני לכם, עד כי יעברו השמיים והארץ, לא תעבור יוד אחת או קוץ אחד מן התורה, עד אשר יקוים הכל. And he came to Nazareth, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. יען משך אדוני אותי לבשר. I think he wasn't just being specific. I think he was being emphatic when he said, do not think I have come to abolish the Torah. I didn't come to abolish the Torah or the Nevi'im, the Law of the Prophets. I came to fulfill them. Again, not just a specific statement, but probably there's an exclamation point attached. The reason being that, of course, Jesus didn't come to throw away things Jewish. I mean, it's a simple point, true, but many didn't get it. Going through the first century into the second century, many Christians were so convinced that obviously uh, Jesus wants nothing to do with the, the Hebrew Bible that uh, it was not even considered part of sacred literature. It took uh, a considerable amount of energy for the church to come to terms with the fact that the Hebrew Bible was still part of the Christian testimony, if you can imagine that. It is so bizarre, but sad to say it is so very true. And the reason why I mention that is because it's amazing how individuals who want to follow Jesus can be so unaware of the essence and substance of what he's really talking about. 
Jesus didn't come to knock the legs out of things Jewish, but to offer fulfillment to the hopes and the aspirations and the literature, the divine literature of the Jewish people. One needn't take my word for it, just visit the literature where he said again, do not think I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus isn't about destroying people and destroying stuff. Jewish people, Jewish stuff. Old Testament stuff. Jesus didn't come to put all that down. Tragically, however, that has not been the church's story. One can look at uh, medieval art and architecture. In churches around Europe, there are statues depicting one woman, uh, Ecclesia Triumphans, the picture of the church triumphant, proud and strong. And next to her is a statue of this woman that's shamed, that's downcast, looking down, depicting the synagogue. It's tragic how it went that way because Jesus, according to his own words, never wanted it to go that way. He rather was game to show people, to use the Pauline language, a more excellent way. Jesus didn't come to trounce all that, but rather to fulfill it, to show individuals how to live it out. And that is exactly what he does in the Sermon on the Mount by saying, you know, here's the way others have understood that, but let me tell you what it really means. Let me show you how it's fulfilled. Let me show you how you can mine the biblical story and find practical street level value. Jesus' point, if there's any criticism, he says when he finishes, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, then you're in trouble. The problem isn't with the literature, the Old Testament sense, as much as it is the way the people were misconstruing it. Jesus came to set that right. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he does just that by unpacking the essence and the substance of what it means to walk with God according to the Old Testament, according to the New. שמעתם כי נאמר לראשונים לא תרצח, וכל רוצח יחויב לדין. ואם תכשילך אין ימינך, נקר אותה, ואשלך ממך. A simple disagreement between neighbors and the resulting heated exchange. Neither side will back down as the bitterness has led to anger. Anger has led to fermenting rage. And now all common sense is gone. What began in the heart has led to this. I've seen anger, and frankly, I've seen murder. And I want to tell you, it doesn't look good. If you know of any uh, police officers, firefighters, paramedics, talk to them about it, because there isn't a one that hasn't gone to a crime scene to see what happens when the anger genie is let out of the bottle. The reason why I mention that is this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. He says here, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, and he goes on to give voice to that and more here when he says, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, and frankly, I like the without a cause clause because sometimes there is a kind of justified anger, but not of the sort that leads to what he goes on to describe here. He says those who then uh, call their brother by various disparaging terms, whoever says raka, which is a term meaning to spit. That is, things deteriorate to uh, the point where people are, are performing in ways that are just uh, uh, ghastly. It's bombastic. He says, whoever says you fool will be in danger of the hellfire. Um, if I understand uh, Jesus correctly, he is tapping into not just that people commit acts of murder, but that the impulses that prompt fracture and social decay. Those impulses reside in our hearts as we interact with other people, sometimes improperly. And we allow this stuff just to unravel. 
And Jesus isn't as much concerned at this juncture about the act of murder as much as the deterioration within that precipitates it. Well, we all have human natures, we all work with people, and how should we work with people if we're to walk more closely behind Jesus? Well, he says in verse 24, he, he gives a story here. He says, if you're ready to give a gift unto the Lord, but you realize there's problems with your brother, he says to quote him, first, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I, I think there's some real profundity here and there's implications for people that are involved in you know, Christian ministry or Christian life. You know, in church, we offer our various gifts, and the context here is someone's uh, about to offer a gift in the temple. You know, some religious sacrifice, some extension of piety, and the Lord says, you know, but if uh, you're all wrapped around the axle with a brother and a sister, take care of that first, and then take care of your religious obligation. The point is that it's incumbent upon individuals to maintain relationship. Hence he says, quote, first, be reconciled to your brother. If I understand Jesus, he would prefer that we develop uh, mechanisms to stay in communion one with another, to stay in community. We live in a culture, tragically, where there's, there, there's so much rupture, there's so much disorientation, and it, it sends people out of control individually. Husbands, wives go separate ways, the kids fall through the cracks. Uh, churches fracture, uh, things crater. It's really horrible, frankly. We've got to put an end to this. And how do we do that? Well, Jesus says that we need to place a premium on reconciliation. Hear me on this as I close. It's easy to find what's wrong with a person. It's harder to find what's right. Let's find what's right. Let's do what's right. Let's look to be reconciled. And by virtue of our so doing, we're going to please Jesus who said, better to be reconciled to your brother. Show your support for Israel with the Pro-Israel Package. In it, you will receive a three-foot by five-foot flag of Israel, four Pro-Israel buttons, a Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem bumper sticker, the Israel's Right to the Land booklet, the Broken Branches book by Zola Levitt, a two-flag lapel pin, the Pilgrim's Map of the Holy Land, and two Stand with Israel koozies. Contact us and ask for the Pro-Israel Package. As you've seen, the Mount of Beatitudes is a gorgeous location. It's like a state park where we, uh, we take you there twice a year, both in the spring and the fall. We take communion there. We worship together. We read scripture. There's something there that you really like. I, if you know me at all, it's about the food in Israel, Mount of Beatitudes. There's a gorgeous church right there, but they have at the entrance, they have the best iced coffee. Okay, that's just a little, a little <laughs> heads up on that. Also, Jeff was teaching in ancient Capernaum. We go there also. We do. So everywhere kind of that you're seeing Dr. Seif today on our program, you get to walk in the same footsteps. We offer tours there two times a year in the fall and in the spring. Levitt.com, we would love to have you jump on the bus with us. Yes. Now let's go back to the Galilee. Shmaatem, ki neemar la rishonim, lo tinaf. Vani omer lachem, kol amistakel alisha lachmod ota, naof naafa belibo. It's the close of a peaceful, warm summer's day. For some, it's a time when all is right. And for some, it's a time when all is wrong. And the Lord spoke unto the multitude. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
Jesus went on record saying that whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Of course, I've never looked at a woman twice and you know, I've never had an issue like that. Hence, I'm in a position to speak in an informed way about what Jesus is talking about here, having been all healed and delivered. Well, that's not quite true, is it? At the end of the day, you can put reverend, doctor, pastor, televangelist in front of a guy, but at the end of the day, a man is still a man. A woman is still a woman. A human is still a human, and we all have these sexual energies within us. Pray tell then, what is Jesus talking about? He goes on to say that after informing that individuals do have those uh, tensions and energies within, he goes on to say that if something causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Those are some interesting expressions, and I might add, they have not always been understood correctly by enthusiastic churchmen. One fellow in particular named Origen castrated himself. Well, that's insane, isn't it? You know, I appreciate enthusiasm, I might add, but that's taking it a little bit too far. What's Jesus talking about when he says, you've heard it was said, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, uh, and he tells you the things that, that, that I just reminded you of. What does he mean by that? And when he says, listen, if something causes you to sin, get rid of it. Is the maker of heaven and earth and the humans upon the earth who gave us sexual energies to propel us and the species forward, having made that within us, is he now telling us that it's acceptable for that to be within us? Frankly, I think not. What then? It's my understanding that having those passions and those interests as we do, we do well to take pains to keep the genie in the bottle until the time. And what do I mean by that? There is a legitimate way to have sexual expression. It's called the union of marriage. If I understand the Bible correctly, there's not supposed to be sexual contact without a contract. Absent that, hands off is the policy. But there are certain things that people do that inflame the passions within. Pornography is an example of that. When you hear Jesus saying, if something causes you to sin, cut it off, getting rid of that might be a good way to go. Similarly, in the way that we dress, if uh, one dresses in a way in order to uh, evoke sin in others, it's best they nip that in the bud and conduct themselves in a manner that more befits uh, Christian resolution. There are different ways that different people can do different things. The point is, we're supposed to look at marriage as holy, and we're supposed to look at sexual activity as holy within the confines of marriage and to take pains to ensure that we're working within that particular frame of reference. I've often said with my own boys, I can labor to raise them for 20 years and the wrong girl can undo that in about 20 seconds. Men, women, let's all of us take pains to walk before the Lord in holiness and righteousness. If we do that, we'll find the love we're looking for. If we don't, we won't. Okay, that just got real. I mean, real issues. Can we say it just jumped from like a G-rated program to PG-13? No yeah, fluff. Probably more than, <laughs> There's not a lot of fluff right there. Probably more than PG-13, you know. <laughs> There's stuff here, you know, the Lord talks about. It really gets to the, it really gets right down to it, doesn't it? We need to hear about it. I don't know if pre preachers are preaching much about that these days. I don't know. No, it's, it's a lot of feel good, so everybody comes back. And uh, of course, people can go click now if people don't want to hear us. But, uh, you know, we're supposed to put some things away. And uh, we're, we're, we're different. We're a different kind of people. You know, I look at this passage, and I can relate to everything in there because I'm human being. I have those 
uh, I have those tensions within me as, as I journey through life because I'm shackled with a base nature. But I want to be loyal to my Lord. I want to be loyal to my wife. I want to be loyal to my ministry. I don't want to bring any reproach to those that are advancing the kingdom. Um, and uh, there's some things here. Put them away. You can see this uh, in the literature. If something causes you to sin, throw it away. To get rid of things. And uh, it's important that we do that, I believe. I was reminded from your teaching that I remember back in maybe the 80s when computers were really starting to come about that I didn't want to get one because you heard that pornography pops up every time you turn on the computer. That's not true. And so I'm just going to say it's kind of the day and age that we're living in. We're, you know, it, at first it was a shock, but now we're kind of used to it. But back then, I mean, it, it wasn't quite out there. I mean, it was happening, but it's not quite out. We see it, everything we turn on, our tablets, our phones, we see that kind of lust and adultery. But back then, it's very interesting that he brought up these topics yes. to talk about and teach. Yes, it wasn't as much. I like to say a young man today can see more naked women in a lifetime, in, an, in a nighttime, than Solomon saw in a lifetime. Wow. That uh, the temptation is there to be sure. But pivoting from the analogy of the technology, you know, over lunch, uh, you know, we were looking at iPhones and, and Clayton, who is an assistant producer here, showed his. It's one of the original ones from a number of years ago. When there's new technology that comes out, some people get the new. Mm -hmm. And I mention that because, not to disrespect Clayton for holding on to the old, but the point is there's something new here in the kingdom. There's something new here with the gospel. And because of the new opportunity on the table, people are beckoned to get rid of the old way of being in favor of the new technology, the new way. And I think that's the good news in the story. I got reprimanded once at church from looking at the Bible on my phone, from an old saint. <laughs> yeah, because it's not what they're used to. Right. Right. And as a professor, I always see people on, on the phones and I think, oh goodness gracious, why aren't they opening up their Bibles? But that's where the Bible that's what was, doing, it's right. a new world. But Solomon also said there's nothing new under the sun. No. So what we deal with in life, those, peop those people, the people in Jesus' day, they also dealt with it. And that's what's so beautiful about his teaching is it relates to people then as it relates to us now. Yes, and what's new is the new covenant, a new deal. Right. The opportunity of a lifetime should be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. And there's the opportunity to get something new with Jesus, and it comes with a great dosage of peace. Good word. We have more to come. Don't leave us. We'll be right back. If you only watch us on television, you are missing additional content available only on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can always visit our website, which is home base for all of our ministry activities and information. There you can sign up for our free monthly newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit the online store. Join us as we tour Israel and Petra. Please contact us for more information. We would love to hear from you. Shalom, chaverim. We're here in Jerusalem. One of the words you'll hear in a restaurant or at a dinner table when you're served food is bete'avon, which means good appetite, or like the French say, bon appetit. It actually means in appetite, bete'avon. So when you serve your meal, or when I give my children something to eat, I can say bete'avon. It's like saying, have a good meal. So this week, when you serve food, or when you're sitting at a restaurant and you're about to eat, you can say, Beteavon. We hope you're enjoying the Hebrew lessons from our good friend, Sarah Lieberman. It's been a good day today, hasn't it? A lot of practical teaching. Yes. And I just, if you don't mind, I don't want to make you angry, bring up the fact that you talk about anger and how to deal with that. There's some angry people in the world right now. That's true. A lot of passion, you know, stuff stirred up. And I get that. Uh, life isn't always the way we want it politically, interpersonally. It is what it is. People need the Lord. He's the Prince of Peace. And that's the opposite of the anger that you talked about. That's right. In, there, or that Jesus taught about. There is a way to, uh, even amidst the difficulties, the turbulence of trying times, 
Uh, there is a peace that passes understanding, and that's available for the reaching, for the asking. You know, and uh, if you haven't asked, uh, do it. Uh, this isn't, you know, people watch TV for entertainment. Uh, we're looking for transformation, not just giving inspiration or information. Uh, lives can change on the inside. Anger can go and be replaced by a new disposition that comes replete with confidence and hope. That's right. So much more on this series to come. We hope you stay with us. We end this day with a song from our founder, Zola Levitt, and we also end with... A word from the Lord himself in Psalms in Hebrew, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store, there, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Our Jewish Roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministry.